Dave told me on, Dave Evano told me on Sunday or Tuesday night, I had said last Sunday I had another sermon on the grill. He said, I'm looking forward to a juicy steak. But when I said that, I was thinking more of pancakes. <laughs> I, uh, I'm not the lover of steak that I used to be. I used to think that was the ultimate food and I, my tastes have changed. And I think if I had to choose between steak and pancakes, I'd take the pancakes. All right. I want to re-preach a sermon that I did a number of years ago, before a lot of you in this room were ever even in this world. I preached it on the 8th of March, 1998, and it was entitled, Decide and Provide. And I think it's needful for me to preach that sermon again. Decide and Provide. Now, if you have a problem of any kind, I suggest the following steps. And I'm going to particularly being, addre- addre- being I'm going to particularly being addressing today or uh, issues regarding work and finances. That's going to be the central focus. But if you have a problem, and this would be true of any problem, I suggest you do the following in the outset. First of all, admit you have the problem, because you can never overcome a problem unless you admit you have it. Secondly, pray to God to help you deal with the problem, being open to any needed correction he may send you away. Then look at yourself first to discover how you have contributed to the problem. Fourth, then brainstorm what you can do to resolve the problem, or at least make it more bearable. And fifth, in wrestling with the problem, avoid like the plague a victim mentality that always wants to blame others or their circumstances for their problem. Now, I'm going to be talking today about work and about needing to go out and get a job. But I want to say at the outset that I recognize that there are some people that have disabilities, they have a child to care for, where it's not really an option for them to go out and get a job. I'm not talking about you. I don't want to cast a snare on somebody that has that genuine issue, albeit in any situation we should all be willing to do what we can about it. And every problem has something about it that can be changed. I don't care what the problem is, and that something is you. Now, the name of the study is Decide and Provide, and I'm going to define my terms. The word decide means to determine a question, controversy, or cause by giving victory to one side or the other, to bring to a settlement, to settle, to resolve a matter in dispute, doubt, or suspense. To provide comes from the Latin word providere, which means to see ahead, to foresee, to exercise foresight in taking due measures in view of a possible event to make provision or adequate preparation, to prepare, get ready, or arrange something beforehand. And the word prepare means to put beforehand into a suitable condition for some action, to set in order previously for some purpose. Get those words beforehand, previously. To get ready, get that word ready, make ready, put in readiness, to fit out or equip. So by definition, to provide, one must foresee possible events and decide on a course of action for dealing with it Uh, and, 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 and preparing for what one foresees as a possible event. Providing by definition, if we're going to talk about income, by definition suggests that you have more than just enough to squeak by the present. It involves having for the future, not just living from paycheck to paycheck, hand to mouth, but that you have something for the future. Providing also involves looking ahead at what you will need. It involves facing facts and making efforts and changes, all of which may entail pain. You may remember a sermon I preached a number of years ago, Choose Your Pain. Sometimes in life our choices are not between pain and no pain. Our choices are between more pain and less pain. 
Now, Proverbs 4, 25 to 27 is a favorite of mine because it embodies the principles I'm aiming at in this sermon, Decide and Provide, because it teaches us to look ahead, consider where we need to go, settle on it, and then go for it. I love to hear the ruffling of, rustling of the Bible pages. In Proverbs 4.25, I know you like to hear them too if I give you time to get there. Proverbs 4.25, Let thine eyes look right on, and thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder, which means to weigh, to, to consider carefully, to think over. Ponder the path of thy feet. Think about where you're going. And let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. So to ponder our path means to consider it carefully. Decisions should, not, should be well informed rather than made hastily or lightly. Established ways are settled or fixed. You've made a decision. You've decided, okay, this is the course I'm going to take. And then looking right on, straight before you, turning neither to the right hand nor to the left, suggests decisive action. This is what I need to do. This is how I'm deciding to get there. And I'm going to pursue this as far as I can without being distracted either way. And the sad thing is, is that a man who does not decide is unstable. James 1.8 will confirm this for us. You meet an indecisive person, you're meeting an unstable person. In James 1.8, a double man, a double-minded man, double-minded, back and forth, back and forth, vacillating, back and forth, back and forth, can't make up his mind. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Double-minded means having two minds, undecided or wavering in mind. This is the kind of man that has trouble making up his mind as to what he wants to believe or what he wants to do. Now, in the passage that I read this morning, if you remember and paid attention to it, Jesus was describing a faithful and wise servant as one who prepares for the future. He knows there's the possibility that a thief will show up to steal whatever he's got. And so he prepares for that possibility. So should it happen, his house won't be broken up. And when we talk about money, I want you to think about the fact that there's all kind of thieves out there coming for your cash. <laughs> Bills, taxes, medical needs... Well, it, I'm talking about people that need to get enough so they can make an investment. You know what I'm saying. Just think of all of these different thieves out there that are coming for your cash. We all, I know I got a room full of witnesses. And if you're smart, you recognize that it's going to happen and you prepare for it. Jesus teaches preparedness in that lesson, even though the main purpose of the lesson was to be ready for the second coming. But there are principles that underlie there that certainly are applicable here. And let's couple that, excuse me, with the fact that our Lord plainly teaches us in Luke 16, if we're not faithful in the small matters, talking about financial matters, then who will commit to us the true riches? In fact, it is an integral part of our spiritual growth and development that we learn how to manage money and teach our children how to manage money rather than just being their perpetual ATM machine that they can cash in on when they're old enough to be taking care of themselves. Now, this instruction to decide and provide for the future was not contradicted by our Lord Jesus in the instructions he gave us in Matthew 6, so, although some might think it is. When you look at Matthew 6, and I'm not going to read the entire passage, I'm just going to pick a couple of things out of it. In Matthew 6, 25-34, he says in verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. 
And he gives some examples from the fowls of the air and the lilies of the field, if you remember the story. And then he says in verse 30, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of, of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So here I am telling you to look to the future, make provision for it. And it almost seems like Jesus is saying, here, Nah, you don't need to do that, you don't even need to think about it. Well, first of all, these scriptures that I'm going to be pointing to you were just as inspired by Jesus Christ as this particular speech I just read from. He's not contradicting himself. There are no contradictions in the Bible. The key is understanding what he means when he says, take no thought. That expression, take no thought, defined in the Oxford's English Dictionary, means to trouble oneself, to grieve, be anxious or distressed. Christ is not forbidding all taking of thought altogether. He's forbidding a certain kind of taking of thought. This would be the kind of taking of thought of the person that works, provides, does the best he can with what he has to do with, and yet still lays awake at night worrying and worrying about how he's going to make it. That's what he's saying you don't do. You do the best you can today, wisely, with what you have today, and don't worry about it. Just keep your nose to the grind, and God will take care of you. What he's teaching us is not to be so consumed with concern and labor for the future that we discard faith in the service of God, like somebody that doesn't have time. I don't have time to read the Bible. I don't have time to come to church. I've got to work for a living. That's exactly the thing that Christ is teaching we shouldn't be doing. Just do the best you can today to provide and then leave it in God's hands without fearing the future. Now, the person that does not decide and provide, I'm going to show you, is a sluggard. A sluggard is one who is naturally or habitually slow, lazy, or idle. One who is disinclined for work or exertion of any kind. A slothful or indolent person. Come over to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. And we're going to look at verses 6 through 11. Perfect description of a sluggard. And if you've ever read the book of Proverbs, and you should have, if there's any one book any Christian and Bible reader should read, it is the book of Proverbs because it will give you life principles that will help you to make, to live the best life you can live in a fallen and sinful world. It'll teach you wisdom. It'll give you principles whereby you can make good decisions in life. And really, your life is the sum total of your decisions. So you want to develop good decision-making skills. And Proverbs is designed to teach you how to do exactly and precisely that. It's a marvelous book, written by the wisest man that ever lived apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. So I figured he knew what he was talking about, especially considering that God was the author of his wisdom. But in Proverbs chapter 6, he says in verse 6, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. It is wonderful how God has given us all these lessons in nature if we will look and read and learn. And here's the, the ant, having no guide, overseer, or a ruler. She doesn't need a boss to tell her what to do. She doesn't need, she doesn't need somebody constantly on her case pushing, 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 pushing to do what needs to be done. Which having no guide, overseer, or ruler provided their meat in the summer. Why? Because that's when the food is available. Provideth her meat in the summer. She makes her hay while the sun is shining, when she has opportunity and means and resources, and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long, see, she saves up for the time when there won't be a harvest, for the winter time when there is no sowing and harvesting. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth. You know, a man that traveleth is certain to come. And poverty will come just as surely. And thy want is an armed man. It'll come upon you with such a force as if you had been attacked by an army. 
if you don't learn how to decide and provide like the ant. You see, the problem with the sluggard is he does not want to exert the mental effort to consider the future, nor the mental and physical effort to prepare for it. A sluggard prefers, prefers the ease of living in the present as opposed to the effort of planning for the future. Now, God not only requires us to work, but God requires us to work a job that will provide providere, you see, have something for the future that will provide for our own. Uh, this verse I gave you the other day when we were talking about de being diligent in business in Romans chapter 12, where Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 11 and 12, and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that we may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. You've got resources. You've got money. You've got something to deal with what comes on in your life. And then in Proverbs, which I've recommended to you, a wise man has treasure, something to be laid up. You come over here to Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 20. Now, this describes a wise man. There is treasure to be desired in oil in the dwelling of the wise. You go to the wise man's house, he's got something to show for his work. Oil and treasure to be desired. But a foolish man spendeth it up. A foolish man is one that when money gets in his hands, he just it, it just flies right through it. He just it's like it burns a hole in his pocket. He's got to spend. He's got to spend. Got to spend. That's a foolish man, not a wise man. And so I ask the question, considering this verse and what it says, do you live on the edge? of your money, spending by choice or necessity every dime you get with nothing to spare? It is not just a matter of working hard and making a decent wage. It's about managing your money so that you have money to spare. So that you have lack of nothing. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 23. Much food is in the tillage of the poor. There's some people, working's not the problem. They'll work. They'll make the money. They'll get the job. Much food is in the tillage of the poor, but there is that is destroyed for want of judgment. They don't know how to manage what they earn. They've never learned how to control their spending and use of money. And so they end up destroyed. Bankrupt, whatever. It's not the way to live, folks. So, if you're always short of money, may I suggest that the likely reason lies with you and your spending habits. What did I tell you in the beginning of this sermon? If you're always having a problem with money, where do you start first after you admit you have the problem? With yourself. Look at yourself first. And then look at what you can do to fix that. And don't be a victim. Oh, well, you know, every time I get a dime, something happens. <gasps> really? You know what that something is? It's called life. Amen. It's life. Things are going to happen, people. It's life. Which brings me, oh, and so, you don't need the latest techie gadgets. You don't need ear pods. You don't need an eye watch. You don't need to dress in designer fashions that cost more money. You don't need cable television. You don't need Netflix. You don't need a theater-sized TV screen. And you don't need to eat out a lot. That bleeds money like you took a knife and stabbed it in a juggler vein. Eating out a lot.
bleeds money. You don't need to do it to say nothing of the fact that it'll make you fat. Because generally it is not the most nourishing food for the human body. Mm. Boy, especially since I have had I have heart disease and I'm supposed to be on a low sodium diet, I've learned one thing about restaurants. They are salt mines. Salt pits. I might as well just go to a, a, a what a cow does. What do they call it? A, a salt lick? Just go <laughs> as well as eat in a restaurant. Might as well. It's so full of sodium. I, I, I have to really be careful. My wife, God love her, she has become a master at developing recipes and cooking with various spices and leaving all the salt out and it's just I even I even buy potato chips cooked in good oils that have no salt I could eat a whole bag I have developed a taste for it they are delicious Matt don't look me like you don't believe me <laughs> Matt and Sheila invited me over for supper one time Sheila wondered what to fix and she called my daughter my daughter said just fix something that doesn't have any taste and you'll you'll have prepared a great meal for Pastor Mott but anyway you don't need to do all that eating out it, it, it's a horrible bleed on your budget you see prudent people prudent people look into the future and they behold the approaching evil and take precautions against it Proverbs 22 and verse 3 Proverbs 22, 3. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Let me read it again. The prudent man foreseeth the evil. He takes precautions, you see. Like the wise, the, the wise servant in, in the book of Luke that, that was prepared for a potential thief. He foresaw that there's somebody could come around and steal what I have. So he took measures to be ready for that. You see, a prudent man foresees the evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are unpunished, are, and are punished, pardon me. Now, when I talk about looking into the future and beholding the evil, I am not suggesting that you need to spend hours and hours on the internet to try to track a coming financial holocaust when the market shall crash and we'll have this huge depression and there will be gangs roaming the street foraging for food and everything will be so dangerous. I'm not suggesting you need to do that. Read a Bible and face the reality of yourself in the mirror and you will learn that it is a dying world. And things will break down and need to be repaired or replaced. And by the way, some people sometimes will spend a lot of time looking on the internet at the coming financial holocaust when they're already in the financial doldrums. They need to realize that for them personally, the holocaust has come. Deal with your holocaust right now without spending hours and hours trying to track one that's going to come. It's a dying world, people. Things are going to break down. Oh, I don't know why things always happen to me. The washing machine broke down. Well, what do you expect? They don't have eternal life. <laughs> they will break down. Cars will... Oh, cars. 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 Whoo! Do those things ever know how to suck money? Man. Proverbs 20, uh, but anyway, Psalm 102, in, in case you need a Bible verse to teach you that we live in a dying world where things break down, how about Psalm 102, verses 25 and 26, so you got the Word of God for it. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish. That's the earth and the heavens, a whole shooting match. They'll perish. They're all dying. But thou shalt endure. Yea, they shall all wax old like a garment. Everything you own is going to get old like an old garment. And it's going to have to be replaced. And as a vesture thou shalt change them and they shall be changed. It is a dying world. Things will break down and need to be repaired or replaced. That's one of those thieves that's coming for your cash. 
And is there any elasticity in your budget to allow for that? Because it is going to happen. So don't you think when that happens that God is frowning on you? It's just life. Just life. Have you provided for it? And then scripture teaches us in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, 1 through 5, about old age. And it describes it vividly. And the limitations and disability that old age will impose upon our bodies. And it calls those the evil days. You see, a prudent man foresees that. A prudent man knows, I'm going to get old. I'm not always going to be able to do what I can do today. It's called the evil days. You will get old. You will break down. It is coming. Have you provided for it? You remember that I told you about the very old woman at the gym that's from Germany? She looks like a stick. She does these exercise classes. We were doing dips one time on the bench for our triceps. She could do better than I. This old woman from Germany that remembers living there during the war times. I went to visit her this week. The poor woman has started falling. Her days of going to the gym are over. She's now living in an assisted living. And I went to see her. Of course, I had a mask on and a hat. That's what she's supposed to do to get in the door. And she looks at me, pull the mask off and the hat, and she goes, <sighs> Oh, she was so happy to see me. We had a lovely visit. She says, What a pleasant surprise. What a pleasant surprise. It was rewarding. But here I'm making a point, folks. She can't drive anymore. She can't go to the gym anymore. Those days were inevitable. They are coming. And so the question is, have you provided for it? Or are you thinking that God will never let that happen to you? That you will always be able to do what you do today? You're not being prudent when you think like that. You're not facing reality when you think like that. Well, maybe you're counting on your children taking care of you. Well, if so, you think it's right that they must do it exclusively at their expense? Have you never read Proverbs 13, 22? This is a favorite verse of my grandchildren. Proverbs 13 and verse 22. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. They love that verse. Only problem is they want to count it. They want, they want to cash in on it now. Well, wait. Wait till after I die. I got to see if it's going to hold out to keep, take care of me while I'm old. And then 2 Corinthians 12, 14. 2 Corinthians 12, 14. Paul says, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. So that if they do have to take care of me, I think it would be nice if they didn't have to do it at their own expense. Now, maybe you're in a business. You have a boss or a partner. Is that boss or partner irresponsible? And are they driving the business into the ground? Well, brooding and anger and bitterness over the situation will get you where? Hmm? Where will brooding and anger and frustration over the situation get you? Where? Where? Nowhere. Have you ever noticed that? It don't get you nowhere. Now, you should have said doesn't, but don't really drives it home. And you're like that, don't you? Don't. It don't. <laughs> it doesn't get you anywhere. And so... What you need to do if you're prudent is you're going to see that for evil coming. And you're going to take steps not to go down with them. Like making sure you've got a nest egg of, next egg of income that should the business collapse, you could survive till you could get into something else. And if you're involved in something, maybe you've launched out on some business and it's just not working. If something's not profitable then do one of two things. 
either improve it by looking for what's not causing it to be profitable or turn from it to something else. Maybe you've got a business and you've got an employee that isn't doing their share of the work. It's time to let them go. Because you don't want your business to go down just because you feel sorry for somebody that's not responsible. You improve it or you turn from it to something that is profitable. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 10, Ecclesiastes 10.10, 10, If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then he must put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. If you're chopping, chopping away, and the tree had coming down, check your axe. If it's dull, sharpen it. Then your work will yield much better results. Just very simple logic. And I love the parable of our blessed Lord. Isn't it wonderful we can always bring it back to Jesus, the one that died to save us, the one who obviously has our best interest at heart, proof in his sufferings and death. And so, wouldn't it be wonderful? Isn't it wonderful that we can go to His teaching and know that if He gave us this instruction, He had our best interest at heart. In Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 10, He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. I'll let you get there. 13, 6. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. So if you're involved in some investment or some business and it's just not working out, it's not profitable, ask yourself questions like, are you where you thought you would be by now? And if not, why not? Why didn't you reach your projections? Were you, where were you, were you where you thought you would be six months ago? And if not, why not? And what's the difference now than six months ago? And if you think that you haven't given this enterprise a fair chance, then do just what the parable recommends. Set a time limit. Give it your best. In other words, make a decision. Have a plan rather than floundering around. And realize this. After you've given it your best and it still isn't yielding any profit, then there is a time to just, well, cut your losses and do something else. And there's a verse for that. In Proverbs 3 and verse 6, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away. And I understand this can be difficult. Very difficult for people when you've invested a lot in a particular enterprise and you've given it your best and it hasn't yielded the results that you thought it would to have to just write it off and walk away and start over. I understand that can be painful. There is a 39-year-old strict Baptist preacher that I'm corresponding with in England. And this man studied to be a neonatal scientist. He actually achieved a doctor's degree as a neonatal scientist. You can better bet that man put in a lot of work, hours, and brain sweat to get where he was. He's a minister now, and he couldn't maintain both. And he had to let that go to give his time to his ministry. But I can imagine that was not easy. It's not easy to let things go. It's not easy to let a relationship go or let a business go or let a hobby go that you've invested so much time in. Believe me, I understand. You know me, I'm fascinated by language. I love learning languages. I wish I could learn them all. And I studied Russian for two years. I loved it. I was good at it. 
I was writing stories. I was writing poetry. But I realized that odds were, when am I ever going to go to Russia? What use am I going to make of this? And I was already still trying to maintain three others. And I reached a point that I just could not justify the effort versus the returns. And I did the right thing. I let it go. And I remember, but if you ever hear me, just, just as a, a, a point of trivia, if you ever hear our family call Brittany Dolch, or hear the grandkids call her Aunt Dolch, the reason for that is when I was studying Russian, she was learning a few words when I would be doing my lesson, and the word for daughter is Dolch. And I started calling her Dolch, daughter, and it just stuck. And to this day, she's still Dolch. That's what, I, that's what I got out of two years of Russian. <laughs> a nickname for my daughter. I mean, a lot of investment for a little return. Albeit, in one way, I don't regret it. Because I have found that when I learn another language, I come to understand my own so much better. Plus, to say nothing of the fact that Shirley Hodgins sent me an article one time that said people that speak more than one language are less likely to succumb to Alzheimer's. Oh! There's hope. <laughs> it's considered to be one of the best things you can do to train your brain because you've got to move it out of what you're accustomed to into something that you're not accustomed to. But that aside, I remember weighing the odds about whether I should continue with this or whether I should let it go. And I'll never forget something Brittany said to me. She said, if you let it go, you'll have more time for the family. That was powerful. Powerful. So, if you're not where you thought you would be, like I say, give it a good shot, and then if, if it's not working, then realize there's a time to lose. There's a time to cast away. It's just not always the time to get and the time to keep. So cut your losses and go to something else. And then, if you are in over your head, and you just don't really know what to do or which way to turn. If you, either from lack of experience or whatever, just lack the resources to see what needs to be done, then follow the advice of someone that can look at your situation, analyze and see where the flaws are, see where the bleeding is, see what could be changed, and follow their advice. Proverbs, again, will step up to the plate to help us here. In Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 15, 12, 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. And then look at the converse, describing a person that just won't go seek advice. They think they've got it, tiger by the tail, they got it all figured out. They don't want to humble themselves to ask somebody else. Proverbs 15 and verse 12, A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. Don't ever be above seeking advice. I cannot even begin to tell you how much I have been helped over the years by seeking counsel and advice from others, even sometimes people under my own ministry that look for me, look to me for counsel and direction. Where somebody else will just see something that I didn't see that will put what I'm dealing with in an entirely different perspective or give me something that will help me to get the right direction. So if you don't see what needs to be done, you're having trouble trying to figure it out, then get some counsel because chances are somebody else can see what needs to be done. You know, it is a sad thing to be blind. And I'm talking here about mental blindness, emotional blindness, where you're involved in a situation and you, you don't see a way out. It's sad to be blind, but the sadder thing yet is to be blind and to think you can see. To think you've got it all figured out when circumstances definitely show you don't. <laughs> John chapter 9. L let me just give you a little piece of advice. When some financial planner 
comes to your house to tell you how to get rich and he's driving a rattle trap and you can see his suit is threadbare, I suggest you get another financial advisor. <laughs> and then... John 9, 40 through 41 says, Some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. The problem with these guys is they were blind, but they thought they could see. Sad, sad condition. And then, while I'm just giving some pointers and tips here, I would suggest to all of you and your young people, remember this going forward, please. Do not even think about building or buying a house if you do not have income to sustain it. Do I have a Bible verse for that? In Proverbs 24 and verse 27, it says, Proverbs 24, 27, Prepare thy work without. See, look at that. Prepare. Get ready. Provide. That's Im That word is right there embodied in the idea of provide. Prepare thy work without. Make it fit for thyself in the field and afterwards build thine house. Have the income. Have the resources to sustain it. And if you cannot afford a house, then what are you doing to prepare for it? And I want to say this, hear me plainly. It is no disgrace to rent. It is no disgrace to rent. I'm going to say something, and I think a lot of people know this. Maybe some of you don't. You're about to know it. And it's nothing to be ashamed of at all. Vern and Cheryl Scholes rented a little house in Utica for years. Years. Vern Scholes is the incarnation of frugality. I can assure you today they are far better off than many financially rather than when they were not ready dumping money into this big house. They rented, saved, and own a lovely home in their old age. I'm not saying it's wrong to take a mortgage. I did myself. But you want to make sure that you have the means to sustain it. Don't launch out on that when you don't. Now, I know there's always things that can happen. I, I get that. But again, we're speaking in generalities. This is the way things generally work. There's always exceptions to the rules. But exceptions don't nullify rules, they establish them. That's why we call them exceptions. And if we fail to provide for our own, well then we have the horrible words facing us in 1 Timothy 5.8. 1 Timothy 5.8 But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. An infidel is a word meaning no believer. Fideles meaning believer. Infidel, prefix meaning no, no believer. He's an unbeliever, worse than an unbeliever. So this gives the lie, this verse gives the lie to those who fail to provide and claim they're trusting God to take care of them. <laughs> this is not living by faith. This is living by folly. Parents, you have a solemn responsibility here to train your children to be responsible and to work. Do not enable them to be lazy. If you enable your children to be slothful, you are enabling them to be wicked because the slothful servant is the wicked servant. You want a verse? I got a verse. Matthew 25 and verse 26. Matthew 25 and verse 26. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. You see, the slothful servant, it had his talent, 
didn't do a cotton picking thing with it but bury it was pronounced wicked and slothful. So when you enable your children to be slothful, you enable them to be wicked. Letting pill- And if you've read the book of Proverbs, it puts absolutely no premium on slothfulness or sluggardness. It has all manner of negative things to say about it and puts a great deal of premium on diligence and hard work. So it is obvious that when you let your children be slothful, you are failing in the most sacred and primary duty you have as a parent. And that is according to Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. You want to impart to your children a sound work ethic and get started early. When you let your children be slothful, you are not training them in the way they should go. You are destroying them by enabling them. What are they going to do when you can't support them anymore? And good possibility, if you're taking care of them, that's one of those areas where the budget is bleeding unnecessarily. Do not let them sit around watching television, playing computer games, and nurturing addiction to social media while they're living off of your largesse. And when you're raising them, give them chores to do around the house and the yard. And when they are of age, send them packing to get a job. I can't stress how important this is. I will share with you that one of the greatest regrets I have as a pastor, we had a woman in this church and she had emotional problems. And we all knew that. And we gave that woman a car. Uh, We gave her money. We helped her pay bills. We even supported her one time while she got psychiatric, psychological counseling. Problem is she would not do one thing the psychologist told her to do. Her idea of getting counseling was just sit there and tell her story. She wouldn't do anything she was told to do. It wasn't yielding a good result. We stopped it. You know, when I look, and so what happened, one car that was given to her, she wrecked it. Some of you remember who I'm talking about. She wrecked it. And she lived way over on the other side of town. So we were going to make arrangements for somebody to go out of the way to get her and pick her up and bring her to church every other Sunday. And when the other Sunday she wasn't here, she was going to be required to listen to the recording of the message and be required to communicate with me, let me know what's going on, and to take a bath. She was coming to church, stinking so bad she was making people sick. This is what I said, you need to do this. She sends a letter I'm withdrawing from the church. You wouldn't even do that. I, I, listen, I don't care what psychological problem you got. You can you take a bath. It's just, if you don't know how, somebody will come and show you how to take a rag and soap and go... <laughs> really? I regret that we went as far with her as we did. We enabled her. We did. The women would have given up a long time ago. It's we guys are the ones that tend to be the uh, bleeding hearts. The only thing I can say in my defense is I've practiced over the years that when I have a situation that I have to judge, if I'm going to err, I'll err on the side of mercy rather than on the side of judgment because mercy rejoices against judgment. But there came a point, and really that point could have been reached a lot sooner. But anyway... You know, I'll just write that off as one of the things in my pastorate I feel I didn't go about as well as I should have. So folks, sorry to break it to you. Hope you can handle it, but your pastor's not perfect. Now, I have something to say to you young people starting out in life. First of all, for any school, I don't care how much you hate it, if you don't have that diploma... That's going to hurt you. Get that diploma. Then, if in starting out in the workaday world, you are unsure of what you want to do as a career, then I have some very sound advice to give you. Get a job doing something. 
And it doesn't matter at this point if, it's, if this is not what you want to do for the rest of your life. You don't need to figure that out now. You're, you lack age and experience. Just get a job, even if it's not what you want to do for the rest of your life, because consider what you will be doing when you do that. You will be developing valuable skills, such as learning to work for a boss, learning to be told what to do, which if your parents trained you as they ought, you already got that one figured out. Learning to work for a boss, learning to work with undesirables. Well, I don't like some of the people I work with. Welcome to life! Welcome to life. You learn to work with undesirables. You learn to deal with the public. People say, I want to be in business for myself so I can be my own boss. And yeah, I'll tell you, one of the most grueling bosses you'll ever work for is what has been called, and I got told I used this too much one time. It's been a long time since I've used it. John Q. Public. And then you're going to learn that life is not always about getting to do what you like. Hello? Life is not always about getting to do what you like. And an extremely important part of any pursuit is all the while you may be working the job that you don't plan to make a career out of, you will be developing your character, which is extremely important. And further, you will be building a resume for future employment opportunities. You want to be able to put on that resume, contact this guy I worked for, that will say, if you get that person for an employee, I guarantee you, you'll have a good one. They always showed up for work. They were always on time. They worked harder than anybody else. That'll take you places. I don't care if it's a resume from McDonald's. And let me tell you this, and I've got witnesses in this church, men in this church, I'm looking at them right now, that it took them a while, but they eventually found their niche. You will find your niche. You may try this job for a while, this job for a while. Listen, when I went to college, I didn't... I changed my major four times. I started out, I was going to be a radio television announcer. I had a little trouble working the controls on the thing. <laughs> I was going to start off with that. That was where I started off at Bob Jones University. Ay, ay, ay. And then, I think from that I switched to English, maybe. And then from that I switched to history. And then I had to take a foreign language. I decided whatever, I was going to become a school teacher because, see, the problem was, is I was started preaching when I was 18. I started preaching before I was out of college. So I had to try to find a job that would coordinate with ministry that I could work and preach because a lot of primitive Baptist preachers did that. And so I, I had to study a foreign language. And I remember sitting in Mr. Van Swart's class, my German teacher. I took German because it happened to be offered in the semester where I was going to start taking a foreign language. You needed to take that to get an education degree. And Mr. Van Swart asked me, he said, what is your major? And I said, well, I haven't really decided, but I was good at it. And he had the, the black book, Deutsch für Amerikaner, and he lifted it up on his desk like this, suggesting I do that. That made up my mind. And I, that's where I concentrated in German and French. Now, I never ended up teaching school. But I don't regret that I learned that. Like I say, I learned a whole lot about my own language and have been able to cross that barrier and communicate with others. I mean, I even have it on record that I've preached four, uh, I think it's uh, uh, three sermons in this church. And one, two, three, four, maybe more than that, I have to go count it in German. Yeah, I have. That's an accomplishment, I, I figure. No, it was four. I, I think I got it now. So, I'm just simply saying this. Eventually, you will find your niche. So don't despair today. If you don't know, just start with something. And you'll get there. Now, let me say this, though. Fooling around and having fun while neglecting to provide for the future... There's a description for that. 
and it's found in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, 5 and 6. So spending a lot of time playing and going to visit friends and burning gas and all of this kind of stuff and going to the movies and going out to eat, this, that, and the other, and not really disciplining yourself to provide for the future, well, let me tell you, when you get in the financial doldrums, do not be surprised. Ecclesiastes 7, 5, and 6, it is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. And I know there's some rebuke in here this morning. If you're wise, you'll heed it. Though probably listening to me sing the song of fools might be more entertaining. For as the crackling of thorns under the pot... So is the laughter of the fool. This is also vanity. The guy that's living the party life, laughing, having fun, and not providing for his future, it's just like thorns, crackling thorns, burning under a pot, and thorns burn quickly, and there's nothing left to show but ashes. You don't want that to be your life. Now, here's the thing. Very, and, and I brought this out in that sermon years ago called Choose Your Pain. Very often, people don't decide to change their situation until they become thoroughly disgusted with things as they are. And then they finally wake up and say, you know what, I don't like where this is. Uh, I've got to make some changes. And that's what repentance is all about, people. To repent is to affect oneself with contrition or regret for something you've done or failed to do, as in provide for the future. To change one's mind with regard to past action or conduct through dissatisfaction with it or its results. I'm, whatever I'm doing isn't yielding the results that I need it to yield. And I'm not happy with this. Good. Good. The sooner you reach that point, the better. And in this whole matter of repentance, becoming thoroughly disaffected with the way things have been going in the past and realizing you need to make a change, let me say this very important thing. When you're doing that, consider the sins of your forebears. And while you're repenting of your foolish mistakes, look at theirs and repent of them as well. You want a verse? I got one. I got two, in fact. In Leviticus chapter 26, you see, some people have the idea that, well, that's my family and I love thy family and I don't want anybody to say anything bad about my family and I don't want to think anything bad about my family. Flush that! Right now! Flush it! In Leviticus 26 and verse 40, if they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary to me. See, you're confessing not only your own iniquities, but those of your fathers. And then in Jeremiah chapter 14 and verse 20. Jeremiah 14 and verse 20. We acknowledge, O Lord, our wickedness, and not only ours, the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against thee. Look back at your forebears. If they were living hand to mouth in financial doldrums, look at what they were doing and don't do as they did. If you had a forebear, a loved one, a parent, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, whatever, that destroyed their health through lack of self-control and self-discipline, don't repeat their error. Learn from it. It doesn't mean that you don't love them. It doesn't mean that you don't appreciate the good things you've got from them. I will use myself as an example. I wouldn't trade the dad I had for anybody's dad. As I have counseled over the years and seen what some people have had for fathers, I've realized that whatever the deficiencies of mine were, I really did pretty well. But my father was a spendthrift. 
Credit cards were the worst thing could, could have happened to him. If he wanted it, nothing would do but to have it now, even if it meant going into debt for it. He would get what he called car fever. Oh, I know my mother sweat that one. That meant I got to get a new car. And he would go and get a new car. And here would come the car payment. My father was a truck driver for Ryder Truck Lines. He was a member of the Teamsters Union. He made fabulous wages. He had fabulous benefits. Fabulous retirement. And he would blow his money as fast as it came in the coffers. And my mother was the one that handled the finances. And I would watch my mother week after week agonizing over what to pay, what to do, because there was plenty of money for I wants and not enough for I needs. When I was cutting grass as a boy, I went and I bought my mother a new wallet because she couldn't afford one and hers was falling apart. I remember when she had one decent dress to wear. And that was given to her by her sister because she could not afford to go buy a new dress because we were in debt up to our eyeballs with my father's reckless spending. And I looked at that and I thought, God help me. I will never live like that. And I drilled and drilled into my girls to avoid debt because I have seen the disasters that come from running up debt and reckless spending with credit cards. I've even gotten cards from my children as adults thanking me for teaching them to hate debt. And furthermore, I taught all my girls. I said, work, save, and have money to bring to your marriage. I'm talking about grandkids. Don't blow it all. And especially if you buy a car, you make sure there's plenty of cushion the income. Because once you get that car, honey, you're going to see money going out like, <laughs> what do you call that with the waters? Well, like flushing of a toilet, I'm trying to think of, like a whirlpool. Mm, mm, mm. Slurp, slurp, you bet. You're going to have a slurpy there for sure. So, but I told my girls, because my wife did this. My wife was raised by parents that were very frugal, very frugal, actually poor, but very frugal. And she had saved up a substantial sum of money when we got married. And you know what a lot of young people would have done with that money? Blown it on a lavish honeymoon or a new car or some, something like that. We didn't. We, we didn't know anything about investing. We socked it away in a little savings and loan. And we were able to sue a mortgage for our first house. That you could do that back then. And we had this staggering house payment, taxes and insurance included, of $88 a month. <laughs> when I moved to Michigan, things were different. I assumed a mortgage up here on a house that had a seven and a quarter percent, half percent mortgage. I wondered how in the world am I ever going to do this? $233 a month. God was good. And we didn't put improvements in the house. We just kept socking away, saving, saving, saving. And I paid my house off when I was 31 years old. And I never had a house payment left yet. But you know what got that started? My little woman saving money when she worked as a waitress in a restaurant when tips were more like a quarter, not $25. So I taught my girls, and every one of them did it, have money to bring to your marriage. Have something to bring to your marriage. It will help so much in getting started and moving forward. And so look at your forebears, like I did my father, and I loved him dearly, but when it came to money, he was not a sterling example. And I determined, no way do I want to live like that. I mean, let me just take that story a little bit further. My father's best friend worked the same job my dad did, made the same money my dad did, same company, same thing. And when my dad wanted to build a veranda, a screened-in veranda, on their property, 
He borrowed money from his friend. Why was that necessary? Because he'd never learned how to manage his own. That's why that was necessary. So I'm just using myself as an example to look at your forebears, see where they made their mistakes, and determine, I don't think I'm going to go there. Very, very smart thing to do, and biblical as well. And when you really develop that godly sorrow for the path you've taken in your life and the mistakes you've made, then that will lead, that repentance will lead to changed behavior. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 and 12, Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, the selfsame thing, that you sow it after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things, you've approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. You reach a point that not only do you regret where you are by your foolishness and lack of wisdom and decision, not only you regret it, but you get mad that you were ever that stupid and you take vengeance on your problem. Then you fix it. Make sense? You come at it with vengeance and then it gets fixed. Now, if you experience failure, and who of us doesn't, we all do. It's a failing world. We're a failing people. I love this morning the confession of my little sister. I was born a sinner, and I'm still a sinner. Honey, don't ever forget that, because that'll be what you are when you're my age. If you have experienced failure, my advice, instead of sitting around fretting about it, and why do these things happen to me? Poor me, poor me. Take the matter to God in humility. As we were told in 1 Peter chapter 5, 5 and 6. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. The first step, people, to becoming wise is getting on your knees and humbling yourself before Almighty God and saying, Oh God, I've been a fool. First step to wisdom is recognize what a fool you've been. And then know this, that when you come before that God with that kind of humility... God is a God of new beginnings. I can cite one familiar passage from Psalm 23 and verse 3. He restoreth my soul. He gets me back on track. Some of the parts of the book of Ezra can be a bit laborious to read, I shall admit. But if you read the book of Ezra, you will learn an overall theme comes out. And that is, hear it children, God is the God of new beginnings. Israel had been taken captive. They'd lost all their property. Many lost their lives, their children's lives. Huge were the losses. They were in captivity. And God in His mercy, after 70 years of discipline, let them go back and start over and rebuild their temple and rebuild their city. And it was a, it was a joyful time. And when I read that book, I just come away. Thank God He's the God of new beginnings. And you will have several of them in your life. But now, I will tell you this, that in that process of re restoration, and in that process of new beginnings, you may need to make some painful choices to do without things you love to get back on track. It's called chastisement, correction, discipline. If you're smart, you won't despise it. I will cite another example, and I'm almost done. My daughter Jennifer worked, saved her money, bought her first car. And I would help my children. I, I, I never bought my kids a car, but I'd help them. Like maybe make their first insurance payment. Or when Caroline bought her used car, there was a thing you could buy that if it broke down, it'd help pay for it. And I would do that just as an encouragement as they started out. 
and she bought her first car and she had gotten a job that wasn't in our neighborhood some distance from us that required she have a car to drive there and one night she was driving home and the floorboard fell out. That was the end of that car and she didn't have money to buy another. Everything in me stirred with, for my poor weeping daughter that had just lost her car to want to maybe go out and help her get another one. But I realize here is a valuable life lesson. Life is a series of starting over. Life is a series of new beginnings. And so I told her, I said, Jennifer, we're not going to drive you all the way out to that job. You're going to have to quit that job. You're going to have to get one closer, one where you can ride your bicycle and one to which we can conveniently transport you. And she did that. And she actually ended up getting what for her was the favorite job she ever had in her life, which was working in a card shop. She loved stacking up the cards, looking at the cards, and selling the cards. But that was what she had to do. She had to go back to the drawing board and actually live without a car for a while while she, when she had already had the pleasure of having one. But I want to say this, children, young people, you are not a car. You can be bigger than a car. You can find ways to manage without a car. When I turned driving age, I didn't get a car right away. I went to college. I rode the bus with all the low lives. And you may need to ride the bus with the low lives because at this particular time you are a low life. <laughs> Until you get on your feet, you are a low life. Or maybe hitch a ride with somebody and help to pay for the gas. There are ways, but they might be painful. Now, as I draw to a close, young ladies, let me suggest that you marry a man that is diligent, not afraid of work, manages money well, and will provide. Don't just look at how pretty he is, and don't look at the fact that he has a nice smile, or even that he treats you politely, all that's nice, but marry somebody that can work and manage money. As Monfred gave sage advice to my daughter years ago, Kuch nicht an die schön er ist, er muss fleißig sein. Which being interpreted is, don't just look at how handsome he is, make sure he works hard. That was good advice. Shall I say she got both? <laughs> And young men, do not marry a woman that is a spendthrift. This one is going to want to blow every dime you work hard to bring home. It's better, I know if you've invested in the relationship, I know it may be painful, but let me tell you, if you don't break it, if they don't change their ways, you're going to have more pain than you can imagine. Money is one of the biggest problems in marriages, one of the leading causes, causes of marital squabbles and splits. So you make sure you're on the same page about money, managing money and earning money. And so I will conclude this sermon by saying to all, have the courage to decide and provide. Have the courage to force that on your children. Teach that to your children. Pull the plug on the computer and the television and all the fun things and say, you don't even get these privileges till you get a job. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be courageous. Quit you like men and be strong. And then Proverbs 31 and verse 24. Proverbs 31 and verse 24. Be of good courage. Just man up to what you've got to face and do. And he shall strengthen your heart. God will let you, give you the strength to get through it. All ye that hope in the Lord. May God add his blessing to this message. Pardon any error that was uttered, anything understated, overstated. Because there's always that possibility from an imperfect vessel such as myself. Watch the sermon of all the Ben Mott that's in it, except the examples I gave that were true and savory. 
and bless it to your good and God's glory. Amen.